Have you ever wanted to create a cool dash effect where your character leaves behind a ghost trail? Well, today's your lucky day because we're going to do just that. We will set up the entire effect with predefined shader code, a little bit of GD script, and of course, Godot's powerful particle system. So make sure you get a nice spot in the shade while we go over what's included in this video. We will start by setting up the particle system to the node. We will configure it with an animated sprite sheet of our character running. Then we'll see how we can use a shader to make sure that the sprite sheet will actually get animated properly while it's getting emitted as a particle. We will also look at why we need a canvas item shader and a particle shader to create the effect. We will even convert the canvas item shader into actual code to see what's going on under the hood. And then after messing around with some configuration, it's already time to sprint through the GD script code involved. So you will know how to implement the effect in your own game. So without further ado, let's dash forward and start shading. So this is where we start. Just a character who can run and it will dash when I hit the space bar. But it's not really interesting, right? So let's change that. All right, so first things first, let's add a particle node. Simply type particle and press GPU particle and press create. Now make sure that it's under the sash node because I forgot to introduce, but our character over here is called sash. And now let's drag it all the way to the top. That way it will appear behind our character because our character is inside the animated sprite. Now press on the particle system, make sure you are in move mode and drag the particle system around the area where the hero is. All right, and now let's rename the particle system. Let's call it dash particles like this. All right, now that we have our dash inside of sash, let's press on it and let's modify the properties in the inspector panel. Let's start by adding the running animation to our particle system. For this, we go inside of our folder and select the sprite sheet we need. In this case, we can simply drag run into it. The sprite sheet will make sure that the particles will look like the character. All right, but right now the particle system is not really doing anything. So let's make sure it spawns the actual sprite sheet. For this, we need to add a process material. So press on new particle process material. That looks awful, but at least we have something going on. Under the hood, this particle process material is also using a shader. This shader uses the particle shader render mode, but more on that later. And in case you want to learn more about particle shaders, then feel free to let me know in the comments. All right, let's improve it a little bit. Let's only show one character instead of all of them. For this, we need to move to the material section over here and add another shader. This time we will pick the canvas item shader. Press on it and let's set it up over here. But because we want our particles to animate, we're going to enable particle animation. Now some other configuration shows up. These settings are crucial because they're responsible for animating the particles and loop through the frames to create that trailing effect. But first things first, then we see that our sprite sheet has eight different frames. So let's cut our sprite sheet into eight frames. And we can do that by increasing the horizontal frame property. So let's increment it to eight. And if we now look closer, we see that there's only one character left. Cool, right? The only problem is that we still really can't see what's going on because it's spawning eight particles instead of one. And let's reduce the number to one. And now we see it nicely falls down. Let's press loop. And even though we press loop, it still doesn't loop or animate at all. And the reason for this is that we also need to increase the animation speed, but not inside the canvas item material, but inside of the process material. So let's open it up. Let's press particle process material. And then under the display item, we see animation. And here it's really important to make sure that the speed is higher than zero, else it will still not animate. This logic makes sure that the animation runs eight frames a second. The way to find out how many frames per second the animation runs is by checking the lifetime of each particle. So if we would scroll down a little bit, we see time. And here we see that it takes one second before it disappears. And now to prove that in one second, it goes over all of its eight frames, we can scroll down a little bit and remove the loop property. And we see it doesn't change anything. Do you understand why this is? As long as the speed is set to one and the lifetime is set to one, it will perfectly run all the frames in one second. But let's see what happens when we set the speed to two, for example. Now it's a lot faster, 
but you see it does not move anymore once it's halfway the animation. And that's because the speed is twice as fast as the lifetime. Think about how we can fix this. So the way to fix it is to scroll down again and enable the loop. Because then of course, it doesn't matter how fast it is, it will loop forever. So what it means is when we set the speed to one, is that the animation will run once in the lifetime of the particle. So when we remove the loop and increase the duration, let's say we set it to three, then we see it's a really slow animation. If we want the same speed as a lifetime of one second, then we need to set the speed to three. And when you do, also make sure that you set the loop to true, else the animation is done before our hero face plants the ground. All right, now that that's clear, let's put it back to one and also set the speed to one and disable the loop. And it's already disabled, so we don't have to do anything. All right, that's good and all. We're using a canvas item shader, but how does it actually work? Let's convert it into a shader material. So let's press convert to shader material at the bottom. Then press on the shader, and then we see how the shader works by examining the actual code. So under the hood is actual a canvas item shader which uses the vertex function to turn our sprite sheet into the animation we now have. So let's dash over the code real quick. Let's start by the shader parameters in the inspector panel. Here we see we still have the exact same properties as we have before. The horizontal frames is set to eight, the vertical to one, and we disabled the loop. So at the top, we see the uniforms that are specified inside of the inspector panel, all right? And then we look at the vertex shader. If we look at the first three lines, we see that the vertices get divided by the total amount of frames. This makes sure that the vertices will now get the dimensions of a single frame. Then we see particle total frames and particle frame. So the particle frame selects a specific frame and it does this by the instance custom variable. This variable is holding the rotation on the X axis, the actual percentage of the lifetime from zero to one on the Y axis and the current animation frame on the Z axis. And that's the one being used here. And it's important to note that it does not stop incrementing once it reaches the index of the total amount of sprites. The index simply keeps incrementing until the particle becomes old and dies. And then we see a simple if statement. This if statement determines whether the UV coordinates should continue looping over the texture or stop at the last frame. And because the logic runs inside of the vertex function, the if statement runs once per vertex, not per fragment. Be aware of that. And one might wonder why it used the if statement. Does that not potentially cause branching? So in this specific scenario, using an if statement is perfectly fine. This is because the if statement applies the same logic for every vertices, preventing any divergence, which effectively turns the operation into a branchless operation. And now when the if statement is done, let's move this to another line. So first we scale down the UV coordinates to fit the dimensions of a single frame of the sprite sheet. This adjustment ensures that the texture space is appropriately divided according to the number of frames in the sprite sheet. Then when it's done, we add some translation. So let's clean the code up a little bit so we can see what's going on here. So this last piece of code translates the UV coordinates to position the correct frame within the area of our vertices, ensuring that the desired animation frame is displayed. And even though this template is completely fine, we can optimize it a little bit. Think about how we can do this. So the way we can do it is to only write to the UV variable once. So let's take the UV and place it behind the equal sign and then divide it with the frames like we just did, but now store it inside of a vector two variable and let's name it scale UV like this. And then below we can simply set it to equal and then add the translation to the scaling. And by doing this, we make sure that we only write to the UV variable once. All right, now to understand how the material of the particle system works, let's now focus on the actual particle shader. Cause be aware, this canvas item shader is the one that actually renders our particles on screen, but it's not the actual particle shader itself. The particle shader is stored inside the process material that we see at the top over here. And we can also convert this one into a shader material and then we'll see how the particle shader works, but let's do that another time. 
let's instead finish our effect. But before we do, let's have a brief explanation what the roles of the canvas item shader and the particle shader are. So particle shaders are a unique kind of shader that does not draw objects itself. They are solely used to calculate the particle properties, which are then used by the canvas item shader we just saw. So first the particle shader runs, which tells each particle how to behave. And once that's done, the canvas item shader takes over and draws the actual object based on the output of the particle shader. All right, enough theory, let's set up the particle process material. Let's give Sash a break and let it stop falling. For this, we press on accelerations and then gravity, and then we make sure that the y-axis is set to zero, because of course the y-axis is responsible for up and downward movement. Now let's make sure it has some transparency and that it fades out at the end. For this, we need to change the colors, because of course, that's where we also find the alpha channel. Let's close the accelerations and let's open display. And there we see color curves. Let's create an alpha curve. Let's press new curve, press it, and add a new curve material. At this moment, Sash just disappeared. And that's of course because we set it to zero from the beginning of the animation till the end. Let's change that by pressing on it and dragging it to 0.5. Let's keep a little bit of transparency by starting at 0.5 and then dragging it to zero at the end. Now it nicely fades out. And believe it or not, this is already mostly it. Let's make sure to select the particle system and the move mode. And then with the move mode selected, let's drag our particle system over our character. Make sure the feet align properly and then press play. So the moment we run, we see that we already have a nice shadow behind our character. It does not really flip when we take a turn, but at least we have something. And maybe it will also look a lot better when we add some extra ghost to the scene, don't you think? All right, let's close it off and let's set the amount back to eight. Let's also speed up the lifetime a little bit. Again, if you think you can do it on your own, then please try. So for this, we scroll down and we go to the lifetime property and set it to 0.5. Now a question for you, do you think we need to enable loop right now? And the answer is no, because the speed is still at one. So it doesn't matter what the lifetime is, it will always run the total animation once. Now let's play the scene again and let's run around a little bit. Now let's fix the turning because this looks pretty ugly. So we have to make sure that when we go left, the particles also move to the left. And for this, we need to make some changes in the GD script. So let's go to Sash and open up the GD script file. Here I prepared a simple walk script. So at the top, we import the animated sprite of our hero Sash and the particle system for our dash. Let's comment in our particle system like this. Then over here, we specify some properties like speed, dashing speed, etc. Most of it is actually just from the standard Godot movement template. I will put a link to it in the description below. And then we look at the physics process. At the top, we enable gravity. This makes sure that when our hero jumps, it doesn't float off to the moon, but instead nicely lands on its feet again. And then we have some logic specifically for the jumping. First, we check if we press the UI up key, which is the arrow pointing up on our keyboard. And then we add some velocity to the Y axis to move our character up. And we also play the jump animation if we had one, but I didn't set it up. All right, and then we have the variable is dashing. This holds a Boolean true or false, which we then use to enable or disable the emission of particles. So let's also make sure we comment those in. So when we're dashing, we want to see the particles and when we don't, we don't. All right, and if we then go down a little bit, then here we see the code that flips our character around once we turn direction. And we need to do the same thing for our particle system, but instead of the flip H property, which we don't have on a particle system, we can flip the X axis around on the scaling property. Those who follow my course know that when you negatively scale the vertices, you effectively flip the texture around on the X axis. And that's exactly what it does right here. And in order to make it work, so make sure to select the dash particle, open up the process material, then click on the particle flag and disable the disable Z. Now, before we can see if it worked, we need to enable one more line, which is simply there to stop dashing once our character doesn't move. All right, let's hit play and let's run around a little bit. And that looks pretty good, don't you think? And if we move the other way, it nicely moves with us. 
all done without writing a single line of shader code. Yeah, you're right, except that one line to improve the template a little bit. And although this already looks great on its own, you can do even better. Be creative and turn Sash into a glowing light bulb, for example. Or maybe you want to make Sash flash or dash or something like that. If you enjoyed this tutorial, then make sure to dash over to that like button and smash subscribe for more shadingly awesome tips and tricks about Godot shaders. And before you leave, I want to thank everyone joining the course. The army already exceeds over the staggering 700 students. Do you also want to join my shader army? Then I would be honored to welcome you into the shadow world. Join my course now with a big discount and learn how to create stunning effects for your 2D games. You will learn everything from the very basics to advanced topics. So now that you learned how to dash, use the skill and dash to kudo2dshaders.com. And as always, stay creative and stay away from the light. Until next time.